the video you're about to watch was made at the church at Fort Collins on Sunday morning, January 10th, 2021. On that Sunday morning, Rick Richter was preaching from the book of Genesis, chapter 10. The title to his sermon was, The Rise of Nations, A Biblical World View. If you have any desire or know someone who would like to live stream our service on Sunday morning, there will be an email address at the end. Well, good morning, you guys. We better get going here. Um, good to see you. And all of you out there in video land also, we're just glad to have you here this on this uh, snowy day. And uh, what a pleasure to see you this morning. Um, let's go to prayer, can we? Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news about Terry and Nyla. And Lord, we just pray over all of those that are going through and struggling through physical and, and uh, mental issues. There's a lot going on in our little church, a lot going on in our world. And as always, Father God, we're going to trust in you just to watch over it all, take care of it for us, and... Uh, as the banner says, be still my soul. Lord, we invite you here this morning. Your son, your spirit lives in our heart, and we are so thankful for that. Calm our anxious hearts. For the whole country, I ask that, Lord that you would just calm the anxious hearts and just everybody sit back and see what you're going to do. Exactly. Amen. We pray over our leaders that as we do this transition, that it goes smoothly. And we pray that this new leadership will be what it needs to be for our country, not for themselves. So many people frustrated. But Lord, here in our little church, we're going to draw close to you. Speak through Rick in a mighty way today as we go through Genesis and and uh, continue our journey. We've learned so much about you and the people that you put in charge. The people, Noah and, and Abraham and Moses, and although I have no desire to live over 500, I just appreciate so much more because of this journey, what they did for us thousands of years ago. So, be with us this morning that we will open our hearts, minds, and souls to what you would have us hear, and we pray it all as we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And if you would take your Bibles, please. Hmm? Oh, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel. And if you go to Daniel chapter 2, and we are reading verses 44 through 47. Old King Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream, and he wants to know what it's all about. And it turns out the people that he thinks are the magicians, they don't know. So they call on Paul. All right, verse 44, chapter 2. 
in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a, straw, that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then... King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Wow. And then turn back to the book of Acts. And we are looking at Acts 17. Paul and Silas and Timothy have gone to uh, Thessalonia. And we're looking at chapter 17, verses 24 through 28. The God who made the world and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as ever some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Wow. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning, kids. How are we doing? It's been a while since I've made your acquaintance. We had a little, little a shortage of staff at ESIS a couple weeks ago. So I missed my second Sunday, but I'm making up for it today. So you better, if you have spurs, put them on now, right? And um, I've really been looking forward to this 10th chapter. Um, it is such a important part of the Word of God. This particular scripture or chapter for a lot of us when we get to it like in, when we read sections of perhaps the book of numbers where it's lists of names and so many of this tribe goes to that you know situation uh, Genesis 10 is sometimes and uh, most times seen in the light of the same thing that these names and these this lineage and the ites and the ims and and all this it's like this is the word of god but i think i'll go to psalms <laughs> all right um but i want to i want to change that today i'm not going to entertain you uh, i'm not going to make it so fantastic that you can say man rick that was a good sermon i'm not after that uh what i'm after is the revelation of the word of god to you that's what the Bible's after. So today, let's, let's, let's step into it. We're only going to make it, I mean, this is still a bold, a bold uh, 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 goal. We're, we're going to go from verse 1 to 18. We're going to look at these uh, two offspring 
of Noah and their lineage, Jephthah uh, and Ham. And I want to save next week for uh, Shem, all right? So th these names may be more familiar to some people because they've had some kind of Sunday school, some kind of Berean class, some kind of uh, Bible study fellowship that have kind of dived into this. But this is not a deep dive chapter. It's not like, oh, if you're a serious Christian, you really want to go out there and, and uh, tear your computer apart and find out how your computer works. This is how you get into the Bible. You tear it up. Here it is. All right. No, this is essential uh, of peace because this particular scripture is, is talking about uh, in fact, let's, let's not even tell you what it's talking about. Let's find out for ourselves, shall we? Let's look at chapter 10, verse 1. I'm just going to read down through this. It says, Now these are the records of the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, and the sons who were born to them after the flood. So the flood has occurred. This is happening in Noah's lineage. The sons of Jephthah were Gomer, Magog, Medei, Jevah, uh, glasses, Javan, Tubal, Meshesh, Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riftha, you can probably pronounce these much better than I, but I'm going to try, Togarthma. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, people, from these, the people of the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, every one of them according to his language, according to their families. The son of Ham, sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. Uh, the sons of Cush, now some of these names are going to be a little more familiar to you because you've heard them or read them elsewhere. Uh, the sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, and Sabteca. And the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Now, Cush fathered Nimrod. You've heard of him before. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Uh, it was a saying. It was a t-shirt of that day. And the beginning of this, his kingdom, that's Nimrod, was Babel, Erek, Erek, Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Now, the land of Shinar uh, is the along the Euphrates, all right? Further east than, um, than where we find Jerusalem and such. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is a great city. Mizraim fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lahabim, Nef to him. Path Rusim, Kalusim, and um, Kaphtorim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn was Heth, the Jebusite and the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivtite, the Argite, the Sionite, uh, the Arbadite, the Zemarite, and the Hamathite. And afterward, the families of Can the Canaanite were spread abroad. The territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon, going down toward Gerar, and as far as Gaza, and going toward Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, as far as Elisha. These are the sons of Ham according to uh, their families, according to their languages. Okay, let's step back through this, and man, let's get some, let's get a few, let's, let's start unwrapping this. Uh, I, did anybody go to sleep during that? Okay, tempted? All right. Um, now, we, if we went back into verse 1, let's take a look, because we're heading somewhere. Somebody, somebody read for me what today's title is. What, are, what is today's title? What's it say on your bulletin? You didn't get a bulletin? I'll get you one. What's that? Wow, that sounds like a pretty good... That sounds like a pretty good deal right there, doesn't it? The rise of nations, a biblical worldview. What, a, what is a worldview? A 
Anybody got a thought? What is a, what is a world view? That's not like you're up on top of Monarch Pass, okay? Uh, so what would a world view be? We all have one. Okay, yeah, I like that, all right. Everybody, everybody has a world view. Uh, it could be one you got from your mom and dad. It could be the one that your friends uh, pretty much hold to. Uh, it could be the one that you, you see on TV or uh, on the internet. Um, but a world view is how we perceive the world. And how we perceive the world is how we move in it. That if we perceive it as hostile, we're very careful. If we perceive it as, uh, hey, everybody's doing what I do, then uh, that's a, that allows us, at least in our minds, a greater freedom. All right. But a worldview is something that this is in the scriptures that we're reading. Certainly, the rise of nations is occurring. But when we get to the word in verse 1 about generations, these are the records of the generations. That word generations means, it means descendants and their course in history. So we're taking a look at all these names in reference to descendants and their course in history, where, where this um, lineage was taking them. What was the roots of their lineage? Um, that um, in, in terms of a, a, a young pastor going to go to a church and be that pastor of that church. Um, you know, young pastors a lot of times are full of skookum. They're, hey, they're going to they're gonna do it all, change it all, be it all. Okay, I don't, I don't know where I learned that, all right? But... Um, what happens is, is that that young pastor can go, only go so far as that culture or the foundation of that church in terms of what it was built on. Uh, I've been to some churches that were built upon founding um, members who were the bulk of the financial support. And then when the young guy comes in with all the great ideas and new ways and what we're going to do, what that, that sometimes that, that, that foundation of that church becomes a glass ceiling to that because they, they want to protect their church. They want to they make sure it holds fast to, you know, Grandpa Edwards and the Jones family up the street. And you got to remember, these were great saints. And they, um, I served a church one time that the whole building was full of plaques. This is in the memory of so-and-so. This is in the memory of so-and-so. I moved the hymnal. Uh, the, the hymn order that was up there, and it was like I tried to burn down the parsonage. I mean, it was, it was. I mean, there was this this jolting reaction, uh, and what happens is, is that church, or that business, or your own household, is built on foundations, and those foundations begin to bring what begin to be the character of that going forward. That character of what we were just talked about in terms of the course of that history. The course of history begins to have a personality to it. Okay, does that make sense? All right. And what we see here in the description in these names, what we see is that, that hum, human, humanity was beginning to spread. It was beginning to move out um, from... Um, where the ark had landed, where the vineyards were planted, and began to, it began to move in different directions, okay? Let's take another look at the, the names, okay? The, the name of Noah, it means rest. The name of Shem, it's, it, his name means name, all right? And, and, and by name, it means like a sign, all right? Uh, don't you look for that when you're getting off, trying to get off the interstate? You're looking for a sign, right, to say, take this exit, correct? Uh, that's kind of this guy's name, the underlying meaning of his name, all right? And you take a look at Ham, all right? Now you're going to laugh at this one. It, it, I'm not trying to be funny. It it's actually means hot, 
right? Hot ham, right? Um, Jepeth means opened or expansion. Jepeth's lineage, this son of Noah, right? Uh, that there's really, in terms of lineage, we get the smallest picture uh, of his lineage, and yet the extent of uh, Jepeth's um, uh, leaving that area and going somewhere else was he went to the north and then the east and west. I mean, it spread not all at once. He didn't do all the spreading. But his name actually means expansion. Go west, young man, but also go east. So this is where we begin to see the nations that begin to sprout up in different parts of the world. Keeping in mind that a nation, it, the, word, the word nation in the Bible is different than our English word for nation. Uh, the word nation in the Bible is goim. I have to spell it G-O slash I-M to be able to pronounce it closely. Goim. All right. Now, uh, in the Jewish culture, to call somebody goim is like calling somebody a gringo if you're, if you're from Mexico. Okay? It's, 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 he's, the, the, it's like, uh, it, depending on how it's said, it's like a derogatory term. It's not like cursing at them, but it's like labeling them. It's like sizing them up. Goyim means the nations, all right? And the nations were seen as you were Jewish, and then there was the nations. There's everybody else. They're not us. We are we. We are us, but we are not them. They are the nations. But this word <laughs> goyim that I'm telling you about is not calling, uh, we should call ourselves Goyim, I guess we could do that without being derogatory, but it's not really talking about non-Jews. It's talking about a body. Nations seen through the eyes of a Hebrew as a body. All right? It becomes something to where these nations as they are looked at okay, become something to where just as a person has all these parts to your body, as we get older, we, we have to maintain those parts more, all right, um, or at least we try to, but it means a body is made up of many parts, thus by extension the corporate body of people is the same, it's a body of people, it's goyim, okay, it's goyi, okay, and this corporate body is functioning in a particular way. Just like when you get married and you go to your in-laws or you meet your wife's family for the first time. All right? It can be great. But typically it's awkward. Their culture is different. How they have dinner is different. All right? Meatloaf. What are they doing? This is not meatloaf. This is not like my mom's meatloaf. Um, and so nations began to arise. These descendants began to go out into the world and occupy different places. And it says, sons of these um, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth um, were born after the flood, and they began to go forth. So the first one we're going to look at is Jepheth. And if you remember back in the ninth chapter, Jepheth wasn't cursed, nor was Ham cursed. Ham's family was cursed. Canaan was cursed, but not Ham. All right, we'll go back and look at that. Um, but with Jepheth, he had sons, Gomer, Magog, Madel, Javan, Tubal, Meshesh. Okay, now... If you have read the, how many of you have read the book of Revelation? Do you see the word Magog in there? Yes, you do. You also see in different parts, you'll also see in um, Ezekiel and 1 Chronicles, uh, you'll see um, these names repeated long after the death of 
the particular person, all right? But what's going on is the body. What's going on is what was underneath and what established that nation begins to go forth. And it begins to be something in the world that some of these names come right down to our times and flow into the end times. And so as we begin to grab this, we begin to see that this peace regarding nations is pretty amazing. Jephthah and his uh, offspring spread to the north, east, and west. Some have extrapolated because of um, what these names, the, if you pulled the name apart and looked at it in terms of trying to compare it to regions, have said, well, this is where this uh, particular nation started or, or grew, all right? And so, but I want, I want to stick to the biblical record today. I don't want to, uh, I, I just don't want to flim flam you about, oh, well, this was Germany and this was, uh, I'm just saying they began to move to the north, the east, and the west. And the sons of uh, Gomer were these two, uh, I'm, I'm in the third chapter, Rephath and Togarma. The sons of Javan were Elish, uh, Elish, Elisha, or Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Uh, this is including the nations which eventually became India and Iran and Russia and the Balkans and Greece, uh, Europe, Britain, Ireland, seafarers, and Americas. It's, it's, it's Gentiles, really, if you can kind of grab that. Now, some of this testimony, like in Magog, we already listed uh, that name that you're going to see through in different parts of the Bible. We see that some of this, n the nations that came out of them are bent against Jerusalem, are against spiritually the church. We see this, this resistance even in our day. Uh, if you have uh, listened to the news and you see any leadership from Iran give a speech, always in that speech is death to Israel. I mean, not like slyly put in there, I mean directly. All right. And some of this spiritual resistance we find coming from the root of the development of these nations. As we begin to look at the sons of Ham, uh, we, we, in verse 6, it says, Ham, or Cush, Mizram, Put, and Canaan. Now, Canaan is a, one we can grab. Um, and the sons of Cush were uh, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rema, Sabteca, and the sons of Rema were Sheba and Dedan. Now, Cush fathered Nimrod. The name Nimrod. <laughs> Uh, even though we use it in a derogatory term. You Nimrod, okay, have you heard that one before? Okay. Um, that really didn't come from any historical view of this particular person, all right, that his name actually means rebel. Now, in, in this account that we read in terms of his mightiness, all right, we don't, it, it's not like, oh, this guy's a, a good guy or this guy's, a bad guy. It's just de describing this guy and his skill as a hunter. And, but it says in verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom, now kingdom here is sovereignty. All right? What's the, what's the limit, uh, territorial limit of the United States from its shore out how far? Three? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I believe it's 12, but it, it could be different than that, all right? I'm just saying that each nation determines the, the influence of its sovereignty, all right? That if you fish on the inside of this uh, boundary, you're, it's illegal, and we can make you stop or we can arrest you, all right? It's sovereignty, it's the seat of of authority. So not only have we seen this word nation, now we get this first uh, individual that becomes a sovereign, 
becomes a king, becomes, uh, has a kingdom, and becomes the seat of authority that believes uh, in ancient times, and some, some may still believe this in some ways, that it's a divine appointment, an authority based uh, on their heritage, their faith, or what they've manipulated, right? That they want their sons or their daughters to be kings or queens forever, okay? It becomes something to where it's uh, this uh, sovereignty is seen in this person. Now, this is important when we look at the rest of the names here because this, these, these names that follow verse 10 are not names of people in terms of maybe they were in the beginning, but these are names of places. So Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna and the land of Shinar, Shinar all right, are all locations. So it's saying that Ham began to spread in a way that it, this Ham began to spread laterally, all right, it began to spread laterally into what's Iraq and Iran, okay, began to spring laterally, okay, into North Africa and then south, all right. Now, how many of you have heard that uh, um, darker-skinned people came from the lineage of Ham? Have you heard that? Okay. Now, some of that's true. But some of us have heard this term Hamites, that because of a curse, they're using the curse back in chapter 9, where uh, um, Ham sees his naked father and is cursed, but Ham's not cursed, okay? Canaan is cursed. And we see that travel into history, don't we? All right? But what people have done is they believe that Ham was cursed and therefore people with darker skin are cursed. That's been, a, that's been something that's been shared from pulpits for centuries. All right? And the Mormon church uh, preached that for a long time. But you've got to remember, Ham was not cursed. His offspring was cursed. All right? So this lineage, as we would use a worldview on this scripture about the world, we could look at it geographically. We could look at it from a family basis. We can look at it from a historical basis. But what I want you to begin to see is look at it from a spiritual basis. Look at it from the kingdom basis. Look at it from the biblical basis. Because what's happening here is the world is beginning to what? Nationalize. It's beginning to have a corpus, a body. It's beginning to have its essence and its direction and its, its sovereignty based on what's at the root of that nation. Just as we see uh, an example in our own time of North Korea. And, you know, we, 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 what we used to see when I was a kid out of Russia, uh, you know, it was almost like if you, there was a, there would be this interview or this person speaking, and if they were from Russia and they were a leader, you could say the sky is blue, and they go, no, and yet, it's not blue, it's, 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 it, we say it's red, you know, and there was just this contention, Khrushchev, you remember Khrushchev pounding his shoe, all right? It was like he just wanted to make sure he did not agree with anything because we're not going to get walked on anymore. If you look at Russian history, you'll find out their thinking comes from being oppressed. Their thinking comes from being controlled. And so they will do anything. They will, they will fight you over nothing, just like a mouse. You back a mouse into the corner, that little mouse will try to fight you. Well, when that little mouse has nuclear weapons, it becomes a different thing. So we see here, are you following me okay? I'm not trying to lose you or say, man, Rick knows a lot. Listen, the only thing I know is what God reveals. See? That's really all I know. But see, he's willing to reveal it. 
He's willing if we'll learn it. Not so that we can go and impress people at a dinner party, but because our worldview begins to be shaped by this perspective that God has about the world. Because I'll tell you what, nations are shaking, folks. Our own is. Nations are shaking. Why? Because nations have always shook. Why? Because nations, though they are sovereign and can even be a kingdom, are not the kingdom of God. They are not. Okay. So this Nimrod person has established a kingdom, but we don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy, do we? until we begin to look at the cities that he built. Okay? As we get down through this list, all right, uh, from, from the land, from Shinar, from the land he went and to Assyria, and he built Nineveh. Now, the Assyrians was a nation that had a character. And their character was to take, like a hunter. They saw every other civilization and nation as something to be hunted, captured, and, and, and despoiled for them. They would move entire regions to a different part of the world once they conquered them. They would do such murderous Vile, violent things. They ruled by fear. And we just said earlier that a family and a nation has something at its root that not only brings, and we see its history, but we also see that it begins to be what? It brings the character at the root. All right? And so we can see that though Nimrod here is not displayed as a good or bad guy, we can see his character being exercised in Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrians. The Assyrians were a nemesis to Israel. And the Assyrians were unlike the Babylonians. The Babylonians were like, come and put their arm around you, and then they would take all your stuff, okay? And they would let you pretty much stay there, even though Nebuchadnezzar uh, put Israel into a, uh, uh, took them to, to Babylon. For the most part, he'd let you stay there, let your culture stay the same, kind of like the Romans. They would kind of let you be, but then they would tax you, and then they would get you, and then they would expect of you, all right? And so this fear was at the base of it, but they were also, these Assyrians they were the most of all hatred by their own people, by their own subjects. And they were almost in a constant state of rebellion. That this nation that rules by fear became something that what? Man, you can't hang on to it. Alexander the Great, tremendous conqueror, terrible establisher. He had so much infighting uh, among his own generals, especially when he was on his deathbed, if you know that history a little bit. He was, not a, he was 35 years old. He was not an old dude. And his generals were gathered around his deathbed. Who are you putting in charge? Who is going to lead next? See, they, the seat of sovereignty was in this guy. Who are you picking? And you know what his last breath was? This. He said, the strongest. And so he built this conflict into whatever was next and it became a mess. It became a rich and awful mess. So we see that we can see a piece of Nimrod's character in what he built and what was at the root of it. Now you can see, you can see where I'm going with this, all right? Because when we get to Shem, Shem is the lineage that ends up being the lineage that's accounted for in the book of Matthew and some in Luke and other places, okay? 
where it leads down to this lineage of Jesus Christ. Shem is this, is this name. He's this billboard. He's this sign. But we're not there yet. In Micah 2, I'm sorry, that's not even correct. In Micah 6, 2 and 6, we see this ongoing lineage long after Nimrod's dead. And it's nestled into this scripture we always read at Christmas time, Micah 6, 2, but as for you, Bethlehem of Paphratha, uh, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will come forth uh, for me to be ruler in Israel. His times of coming forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Who is he talking? He's talking about, obviously, he's talking about Jesus coming. But he's talking about this one that's coming will rule. He's talking about a sovereignty of this Messiah who is coming. But in verse 6, this contrast is there, or this, um, what was having to be dealt with in the very day when this prophecy was spoken. In verse 6 it says, uh, They will shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod, at its entrances, and he will rescue us from the Assyrian when he invades our land and when he tramples our territory. So he's talking about a long time after that Nimrod is long dead. He's saying this character, this lineage, just keeps going. And so we see Jepeth, north, east, and west. We see Ham. And we see this, this spreading laterally and south in terms of the, the makeup of the world. But I want to get down to um, this piece here where he's talking about verse 15. Cana fathered Sidon, his firstborn in Heth. And now we're going to read about the ites. You've read the ites, right? Jebusites, where did they live? Is that counts? <laughs> Jebus was their city, became Jerusalem. All right. So we see that their extent or their uh, they're occupying this these areas. Okay. It, it, it says that. Um, um, this, these, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, okay, the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Amorites, remember them? They're always getting attacked by the Amorites, all right? Uh, the Girgashites, the Hivite, the Archite, the Sinai, and the other Ites, okay? Ending in, uh, not, in not in the Zamorite, but in the Hamathite, uh, which means, ha Ite simply, simply means descendants of, okay? Uh, we see this, in the Hebrew, Simon Bar-Jonah. Have you read that in the New Testament? Okay, talking about Peter. Bar simply means son of Jonah, okay? Uh, so these ites, okay, uh, these descendants of, okay, they began, Canaan began to spread laterally into Persia, Babylon, Assyria, Palestine, Egypt, and Africa. And so we see this, this spreading of nations was not just the spreading of individual families. I'm sure there was some nomads in the midst of this. But pretty much establishing around the globe um, uh, nations that were responding and were a part of history, but they were a part of history because of their character. All right? So what I want to bring to you is we're about ready to, well, we're almost ready to land this airplane, okay? But I want to make sure you're catching me. That not only is this a fascinating study, you can get all kinds of stuff, pretty good stuff in terms of maps and stuff, but this isn't good enough for me. I have to get in there and take the jalopy apart a little bit, okay, and look at the parts and make my arrows. I, I'm, I'm not nearly the scholar that all these others are. I'm not... I still have that stuff too, but I, I'm not interested in finding out like, 
uh, so I can go on Jeopardy and win in the Bible category, all right? I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm looking for revelation from God in regards to something in Scripture that we've overlooked. So let's go back to this, to this piece about nations and worldview. Let's take what we've gained so far from these two f- people who've not only had offspring, but those offspring uh, uh, developed into nations. And I want you to catch this particular phrase. God's use of the nations in the Old Testament. Did you hear how I started? God's use of the nations in the Old Testament underscores the fact that both the nations and Israel were under the sovereignty of God. So these nations were doing what their character and their founders and their culture were all about. They were serving other gods for the most part. They, were, they had history. They had administrations. They, they were a collective power. They were a nation. They were a body to exist, govern, and, and exert influence. These kingdoms that sprouted out of these nations became a collective wealth. A, the, a kingdom became a wealth for the sovereign to, to, to use and benefit that purpose of that sovereign. All right, let's take a look at some examples. They were under all the nations of the world are subject to the sovereignty of God. So we see Magog, this resistant, um, we'll get to him in a minute. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Deuteronomy 12.30 says this, Beware that you're not ensnared to follow them. This is the, the Lord saying, man, don't be ensnared to follow nations that have a different culture and foundation. It may, it may look groovy to you, all right? But be careful that you don't get ensnared uh, after they are destroyed before you. So he's talking about even as you conquer this land uh, that's made up of all these city-states and, 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 and nations, make sure you don't assimilate them. This has happened in America a lot, all right? That... I'm an American, therefore I'm a Christian, okay? Uh, Or uh, I'm a Christian, but God just wants to give me money and a car, and he wants to just bless, bless, bless me, all right? You know who's going to rule in the thousand-year millennial reign with Christ? Those who have been beheaded for his witness. He's going to raise them again. Doesn't that sound like, that sounds severe to me, doesn't it? I would like to get enough trouble in the testimony of Christ where it would be like, we're considering beheading this man. Wouldn't that be, that, wouldn't that be, I'm not talking about checking the box or playing on the big, uh, big team. I'm just talking, is there enough evidence to convict me of being a Christian? He says that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? that I also may do likewise. Be careful studying other religions and other um, gods. Because the Bible says later on, man, it's, man, don't even go there. Why? Because it's like, you might learn something? No, you might be influenced by something. It says here that uh, and Psalm 9, 17, it says, The wicked go down to the realm of the dead, all the nations that forget God. Some judgments, folks, are against nations. N- not against just individuals. Nations that become in themselves out of their character and how they function and the, their, their, their trajectory through history that it's so against God, God has to judge them just like he did the Canaanites. That's why Israel went into Egypt because God says the sin of the Amorites is not full yet. He was still giving them grace and time to repent. Judges 2 uh, says this. He says, uh, Judges 2.20, Before the Lord was very angry with Israel because this nation has violated 
the covenant I ordained for their ancestors and has not listened to me. See, the kingdom of God, like any body, like any goyim, okay, has a root to it. That root is not legislation, it's not a, a, the, a human sovereign, it's God himself. That's our root. We're going to see how Israel got, got to the place where they were begging God to give them a king like other nations. They were forsaking God being their king in doing so, but uh, along came, um, God gave what they wanted. Um, in verse 21 of Judges 2, he says, I will no longer drive out before them any nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. So he's saying that there are times nations are used by God to what? Correct us. All right? Because if I don't choose to follow the Lord, and I only follow him because he'll bless me, book of Job, you might want to check that out sometime, all right? Um, see, that testimony of Job is not of suffering. Testimony of Job is devotion. And that devotion to the foundation by which we were started. First Samuel 8. 19. Yet the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. So Samuel was telling them, man, you do not want to choose a worldly king over God being your king. You don't want to do it because this is what he's going to do. He's going to take your kids. He's going to take your money. And when you get in trouble, look at Egypt. All right? Egypt went into the famine. Joseph was used to loot the nation. Everything that was once owned privately became the property of the sovereign, the pharaoh, because of Joseph. That's a kingdom. That's a nation. He says, yet the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but there shall be a king over us, so that we also may be like all other nations. See, there was this desire to say, serving God's too hard. It's too weird. It's too pure. I can't do the animals all the time. I, 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 I want something that's more like me. So that we also may be like all, all, other, all the nations, and our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Wow. Now after Samuel heard all these words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. Nations that we read in the 10th chapter of Genesis are, have this perpetuating history, this perpetuating culture. And yet we find um, these nations and their character persist in our day. The Assyrian character is still among us. Greeks, uh, you know, uh, Babylon, ba ba Babylon, the harlot of Babylon. Do you read that in Revelation? All right. Arab nations, Israel, we, we, these characterizations are still with us. And yet we go to Matthew 28, 18. And what do we read? We read there, man, go and make disciples of all nations. We find nations that are listed over here of being man. Uh, the Medes were, were pre-Persians uh, back in the lineage of Jephthah, okay? And yet, uh, the Bible talks about these serving the Lord. Uh, Javan, Tubal. Tubal's listed up there with, with uh, good old Magog and the guys, okay? Tubal's listed in there, but we have these testimonies in terms of 1 Corinthians 12 where Jews... Now also, there's the Greeks getting saved. We see redemption happening in cultures and in nations that is, uh, they're, they're set free from this underlying direction, and now they find themselves responding 
to the gospel. There's lots of examples. I, I can't go into all of them in Jeremiah and Isaiah and uh, Revelation 20. I mean, there's just a lot uh, of substance here. But I want you to catch not all the pieces. I want you to catch the sum of the story. Revelation 7, 9, and 10. Man, this is so beautiful. It says, after these things... I looked. Now he's looking into heaven. He's seen heaven. And behold, a great multitude which no one could count. And where are they from? From every nation. And all tribes, peoples, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Here is this picture of sovereignty where God is king. We just prayed it this morning. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The only nation, the only body that has the responsibility and the ability because of God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the church. That's it. It's the only organism whose purpose is for her non-members. Nations erode out of the nature of man. And what brought them together, protection, economy, influence, expansion, also brought with it the very expose, the, the setting loose of everything that was in humans' hearts and minds. As a result, the world became a broken world. And as a result, what began to be this lineage, this line. See, history, folks, is linear, like a big line. And events happen along that line. All right? And our speck of dust along this line, it's our turn, it's our part. Which is not, the raw, I'm not going to rah-rah you. What I'm saying is, is that are we being honest and genuine with our own culture? Is our culture mixed with too much other nations? How we're finding ourselves missioned, we have a mission, but we find ourselves lackluster in its completion. That, if anything, the book of Genesis shows us is the fact that both nations and Israel were under the sovereignty of God. Are we okay? I'm not trying to feed you with the fire hose here, all right? Hopefully that didn't occur, all right? But I want, I want you to grasp the value of the word that's sitting in front of you. It is so rich and deep. And you don't have to be a Bible scholar. If you want to learn some really easy Bible uh, helps, they're right on your phone. They're, right, they're, they're free. It doesn't cost you anything. I have a whole library of the amazing things, and you know what? I just do this. All right? But you want those that are trustworthy. You want those that hold fast uh, to God and his kingdom. So let's pray together. Father, we, we bless you. We thank you that, Father, what you've begun, you're going to finish. We thank you that, Father, what you've done is you've, you've popped open this treasure uh, of revelation. Well, we don't become smarter. We just become truer to you. We find that our family history goes way back. That, Lord, I find my heritage, not in just my grandpa from here and my, my great-great-grandpa from there, some kind of, we go back on this minuscule genealogy. No, our genealogy goes back to God and forward to him. And so, Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you're bringing us uh, up and that, Father, that the, 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 the body of the church is waking up. 
Now, Father, some of us haven't been sleeping that great lately, and it's because, Lord, you're stirring us up. It's not like you're wanting us not to sleep. It's like, Father, that you, you, you're, you're putting your hand on our, our heart, and, and you're saying, Son, don't stop where you are. There's, there's not just more like you could do more, but there's more of me. I want you to be hungry for more of me, and I want you to be, I want you to be uh, tender to the nations. I want you to be tender to the city you find yourself in. I want you to be tender to the, to the ring of influence and people that's in your life, that's in your social environment. And so, Lord, we bless you for all these things, and we thank you, Lord, that you empower us, uh, Father, from the inside, to not live for you, but to live from you. And we bless you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So many names today. Seventy names in this chapter. Well, we just come before you now, and we just uh, thank you, Father, for your testimony. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we would have been the wandering uh, uh, Aramean like uh, Abraham, Lord. We would be lost without you. We would be nothing without you, Lord. Our lineage, Father, would be uh, full, Father, of the evidence that, Lord, we had rejected your love and failed to demonstrate, Lord, the, 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 the actual lifestyle of salvation. And so, Father, we come before you today, and we just ask for all those uh, that are watching at home, Father, we just pray for their circumstance. We pray for their family. We pray, Father, for whatever it is that gets the most noise in their life, and that, Father, they would return to, and listen for that small, still voice of God. And that they would find themselves not only encouraged, but empowered. And they would find themselves, Lord, being rooted and grounded in love. And they'd find themselves, Lord, uh, Father, being full of light rather than the fog, Father, that's in our nation at this time. We thank you, Lord. Lord you're our only answer before we have problems. When, during we have problems at the resolution of those problems, you are sovereign to us. And so, Lord, we bless you, Father, with uh, a desire and a hunger for your word. We thank you, that Father, that says, if you come, you'll understand. If you want to know, you can. But you can't get it by just listening with your brain. That, Father, that says that your word is to be received because it's an engrafted word. And so, Lord, we praise you for that, and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. in grace. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for watching the video of our live stream service from January 10, 2021. If you would like to join us for our live stream service on Sunday mornings at 1030 a.m., please email us at the church at Fort Collins 1 at gmail.com.